Sayyid Muhammad Rizvi is from London. He graduated in biomedical sciences and then started studies in Hosa of Qum and London under Sheikh Shramali. He is a certified hijama practitioner and holds an advanced diploma in hijama therapy. Salawat. Please recite Al Fatiha. Bismillah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وخاتم النبيين وهو أفضل الخلق في الأرض والسماء الذي سمي في السماء بأحمد وفي الأرض بأبي القاسم محمد الله صلى وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين واللعنة الدائما على أعدائهم أجمعين من الأولين والآخرين آمين يا رب العالمين قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في القرآن المجيد وفرقان الحميد وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام الدين صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وآل محمد Respected elders, brothers, sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Congratulations to the mu'mineen, to the mu'minat on this great day, this symbolic day which is a day of Eid for the mu'mineen which is a day of Eid for the lovers of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib we congratulate Imam Sahib al-Asr al-Zaman. We congratulate the lovers of Lady Zahra. For this day, her husband was chosen as the crown prince by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam to take leadership, to continue that message for the people, to continue that sharia that the holy messenger was leaving behind. Why the... As the title suggests, why do we celebrate this Eid of Ghadir so much? Why has this day become a day, a symbolic day, a day which has become a sha'ar for the Shia, a day which has become a symbol for the Shia? <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran, the ayah that I had the honor of reciting, begins the ayah with al yawm اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم. الله سبحانه وتعالى is saying the day, اليوم, the day. أكملت لكم دينكم the day in which I completed for you your deen. وأتممت عليكم نعمتي and the day in which I have perfected or completed for you نعمتي my favor upon you. In other words, Allah. In other words, Allah سبحانه وتعالى. By placing that al yom in the Holy Quran is asking the reader to ponder, to think. That whenever the reader of the Holy Quran, be it Muslim or non-Muslim, but more for the Muslim, whenever he would or she would read this ayah, al yom akmaltu lakum dinukum, he or she would be forced to question what day. Because the Quran says the translation, the day, the day. I completed the religion. The reader would be forced to question what day? What was, which day did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala complete the religion? Which day did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala complete that ni'mah, that favor upon us? This is how Allah is starting the ayah. Al yawma akmaltu lakum It is if it, it is as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to remember or wants the reader to question. Or wants the reader to ask and think, what is the sha'n and nuzul of this ayah? What is the reason for this nuzul of the ayah? What was it that completed the deen? What was it that perfected religion? So the reader, every time he would or she would read this ayah, he or she would be forced to question or look into his, the historical context for the revelation of this ayah. And if he or she was to do that, this ayah would point towards the day of Ghadir. 
the day in which Imam Amir al muminin was chosen as a leader after the Holy Messenger. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is remembering this day in the Holy Quran by placing that al-yawm in there. That one special day, it was, it's not yawmain or ayyam days or the, those days or two, two days for instance, but one day and one specific day, it leaves an open question mark for us or for everyone, for the reader of the Holy Quran. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is suggesting or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking one to ponder and think and so that we continue in this. So it is another way, a tradition of God or a sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remember this great day of Eid. Number one. Number two, recite salawat ala Muhammad wa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his sunnah is not to change. His tradition is not to change. Why is it that we take this Eid so seriously? And like we should. Eid al-Adha has just passed, which marks the end of the pilgrimage of the Hajj season. Eid al-Fitr has passed, which marks the end of the month of Shah Ramadan. But which was celebrated by Ahlul Islam, which was celebrated by the people of the followers of the, uh, the Tawheed of Allah, Ahlul Islam, Eid al-Fitr celebrated by all the Muslims all around the globe, Eid al-Adha celebrated by all the Muslims all around the globe. Thank you. But Eid al-Ghadir is an Eid which is celebrated only by Ahlul Wilaya. Those who have with those who accept wilaya as a fundamental part of the religion, usul ad deen. Those who accept wilaya as the roots of the religion, the part of the principle of the deen. So Eid al Fitr for all the Muslims, Eid al Adha for all the Muslims, but Eid al Ghadir is specific to Ahlul Wilaya. Hence, it has become if you like, a uniform of this religion. It has become something which distinguish, distinguishes us from the rest. That we take this wilayat, we take this imamat, this day to be as the asl of the deen. And if you look through the books of theology, the vast majority of books of theology and aqaid, the largest chapter is perhaps dedicated to the chapter of imam. <coughs> Most of the books of Aqaid theology, the ulama have dedicated the largest part of the book to imama and wilaya, indicating or emphasizing in its importance in the religion of Islam. So when someone came to the messenger, uh, when someone came to Imam Sadiq salawatullah wa salam hu alayhi, Allahumma salli ala and he asked the Imam, Yabna Rasulillah, Ju'iltu Fida, may I be ransomed for you? May I be sacrificed for you? Is there any Eid greater than these two Eid? Is there any Eid more symbolic than Eid al Fitr and Eid al Adha? Imam Salamullah alayhi says, Yes, there is an Eid which is known as Eid al Akbar, which is the, which, this Eid is greater than both of them. In fact, the rawayat, the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt have said this Eid is more a'adham, a'adhamuhuma, ashrafuhum, more ashraf, more a'adham, more great, a'adham, more ashraf, more noble than these two other Eid. Ya ibn Rasulillah, what day is that? Imam says, the day my grandfather Amir al muminin was introduced to the people, his wilayat and his imamat, was hung on the necks of the people. Allahu Akbar. This is, and then Imam says, indeed, this Eid is Akbar. This Eid is greater than the other two Eids. And so for this reason, you know, some people may say, well, we have heard the story, we have heard the rawayat, we've heard the traditions. Why the repetition? Why every year to repeat the same thing again and again? The answer is, my attempt to answer it is, firstly, we cannot escape history. 
We are all products of history. We are what history has made us, what choices we have taken, what paths we have chosen for ourselves. So we can never escape history. Non-Muslims agree on that. And the future belongs to those that prepare for it today. The saying, as the saying goes, that if you want to uh, prepare yourself for the future, you ought to study history. So our aqaid, our belief, are rooted in history. It's not that this event took place in history, done, finished, khalas. This, there are certain events that took place in history that form the roots of our religion. There are certain events that took place in history that form aqaid, that form a part of our theology, that our theology is incomplete without certain historical events. The likes of Ashura, we hear Ashura every year, Imam Hussein every year. Though it is, an historical, though it is a, a historical event, it has formed a part of our aqaid. Same goes for the Ghadir. Same goes for the tragedy of Zahra salawatullahi alayha. So these historical events have formed a part of theology. It is now our duty to pass these on to our children, to our future generations, so that it becomes solidified in our future generations. Nasl dar nasl, jailan ba'da jail. Generation after generation, this is to be transferred from the first to the second to the third generation. And if this was to stop, if the remembrance were to stop, or if the Eids, our ayad, our days, symbolic days were not taken seriously, perhaps slowly, slowly, slowly the effect would begin to uh, break down and eventually it may perhaps be forgotten. So these are one of the most fundamental reasons for us to celebrate loud and proud the day of Ghadir. The day, the, the day on which Mu'mineen were honored. The day in which Amir al-Mu'mineen was introduced as Imam al-Muttaqeen. That the Imam of the pious, those who have taqwa, is Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen has, has been given these titles for a very good reason. That to qualify as a follower of this Imam, you are to come under these categories. For example, Imam al-Muttaqeen. Am I that muttaqi to come under the leadership of Imam Amir al muminin It is a very good, these alqab, these names that have been given to Imam Amir al muminin are given for a very good reason. And so we celebrate these days, we come together on these days or days of a'za, the days of wiladat, shahadat, the days of Eid, we commemorate, we celebrate so that this aqidah, so that this belief is passed on generation after generation and it is preserved in our souls. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And there are many ways for us to remember these days. There are many ways for us to live as lovers of Imam Amir al muminin It's not necessary that a table is arranged and a speaker comes, though it is very important, it has its special baraka, and I'm for it. But many other things can be done. For example, some people give water in the name of Imam Hussein, some people feed in the name of Imam Hussein, and offer services in the name of Imam Hussein. All of these way, all of these methods are ways to raise awareness for Imam Hussein. The same could be applied for Eid al-Ghadir. And the other thing in regards to Eid al-Ghadir is, for Eid al-Ghadir, there is a lot of propaganda, there is a lot of misconception, perhaps the truth is covered, perhaps it is not misunderstood. From the mukhalifin, from the opposition, that may not accept the day of Ghadir, though they all accept it, it is, a hadith which is hadith mutawatir, a hadith in which there is no shak, there is no doubt in its originality that it comes from the Holy Messenger and from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you have, you see that mukhalifin, the opposition, cast doubt 
on situations like Eid al Ghadir by saying, well, the Messenger of Allah did say that, but perhaps Mawla doesn't mean leader, Mawla doesn't mean master, Mawla means friend. You find so many different excuses, so many different, different um, tafasir, mufassirin give their own understandings to bring people away, to drag people away from the true meaning of Ghadir. Ghadir in its reality, in its haqiqah is nothing but wilaya. Full authority of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen after Rasulullah upon the Mu'mineen. The Holy Messenger himself says to the, to the Muslim, to the Hujjaj, 100,000 Hujjaj, if not more, gathering in front of him. Alastum ta'lamuna inni awla bikum min anfusikum? Do you, is it not that I have more authority over you than you have over yourselves? They say, qalu bala. They say, they say, yes, of course. Ya Rasulullah, you have more authority on us than we have on ourselves. And then Imam Amir al muminin takes Ali ibn Abi Talib and says, Man kuntu mawlahu fahadha aliyun mawla. Allahumma wali man wala wa'adi man a'a. Oh Allah, Ali is his mawla. Whoever takes me as mawla, Ali is his mawla. In other words, the Messenger of Allah first asks them the question, do I not have authority over you more than you have over yourselves? Explaining the meaning of mawla, explaining authority. And then he says, Ali is your mawla like I am your mawla. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Oh Allah, befriend him who befriends Imam Amir al muminin Oh Allah, be an enemy of him who has animosity towards Imam Amir al muminin Oh Allah, be a friend of the friend of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Subhanallah, Allah's messenger is not stopping the hujjaj in the heat of the desert. Those who have gone ahead are called back. Those that lag behind are waited for to tell them that Ali is your friend. Like I, like I am your friend, Ali is your friend. There are plenty of other occasions for that to be done. This was an important announcement. The lengthiest khutbah, the lengthiest sermon that Rasulullah ever gave in his life. Asking the people, I am to, I am to say labbaik to the call of my Lord. I am to leave the dunya and I leave behind Amir, Amir al muminin as Mawla, as Master. In fact, Rasulullah, why celebrate Ghadir? In fact, Rasulullah remembers the wilayat and imamah throughout the lifetime of Rasulullah. This is a misunderstanding that this was the only time the imamah and wilaya of Ali ibn Abi Talib was introduced to the people. In fact, the first open da'wat of Islam, da'wat of Yawm al-Dar, da'wat of Ashira, when the Messenger of Allah collected 40 from the house of Banu Hashim and announced openly, I am the Messenger of Allah. I have been sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide mankind towards the path of Tawheed and to guide them towards the path of the haq, of the right religion. And then Rasulullah says something very important. This is the first open announcement of Islam. It says, if anyone from you today will help me, will say labbaik to my call, will accept me, I will make him my wali, my wasi, my khalifa after me. Shaykh al-Mufid, Kitab al-Irshad, he writes, no one stood up except Imam Amir al muminin saying, Labbaik Ya Rasulullah. <coughs> Rasulullah tells Imam Amir al muminin Sit Ya Ali. And so he asks, he asks the question one more time. Is there anyone to say Labbaik to my call? Is there anyone to answer my da'wah? No one answers. Again, Imam Amir al muminin who's a young boy, stands saying, Labbaik Ya Rasulullah. And the Holy Messenger of Islam tells Imam Ali, sit, Ya Ali. Amir al-Mu'mineen again sits. The Messenger of Allah gives one last open opportunity for anyone to take the call. And this is very important why Rasulullah asked three times, asked Imam Ali to sit down twice so that no one in history would ever make the claim. Well, if the Messenger of Allah had asked one more time, I would have said yes. 
I would have said Labbaik. I would have stood up. The Messenger of Allah asked three times so that in history there will be no room for any discussion. And Labbaik, Labbaik, Ya Rasulullah, Imam Amir Mu'minin rises again. And then Rasulullah, young boy, introduces him as his wali, as his brother, his vice, vice gerent, his, his representative after him. Again and again and again he announced Imamat, Wilayat, leadership of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen throughout his lifetime. We find many occasions. Ghadir was the biggest announcement. You know, the Messenger of Allah had a habit when he would give khutbah, he would never make so much effort to be seen. Wherever he had a spa space, position, he would sit and he would speak to the people. But on the day of Ghadir, he made special efforts that he was seen. How? When the member was prepared, the seats were removed from the camels. The member was prepared. The messenger of Allah said, this is not high enough. More seats were brought and it was made higher until the, everyone could see the messenger of Allah. The Muarrikhin, the historians say this was the first time the holy messenger made such an effort to be seen by the public. And for a very good reason that he raises the hand of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen three times. He, the the Muarrikhin say Rasulullah is surrounded by men in front of him on his left side, on his, on his right side. And the women are behind Rasulullah on the member, behind Rasulullah, on the other side of the member. Rasulullah turns three times towards the left, Hadha Aliyun Mawla. Straight, Hadha Aliyun Mawla. On the right side, Hadha Aliyun Mawla. So that no one in history will make that claim that we did not see. We did not hear. In fact, there was a person, a Sahabi, a companion. With a, of course, they didn't have speak uh, microphones at that time. He was repeating. This companion had a very loud voice. The Muarrikhin had written whatever the Messenger of Allah would say, he would speak it loud for the audience. And so the whole sermon was recited like this. Amir al-Mu'mineen, salamullah alayh, was appointed and this day for us will forever remain a symbolic day. Ulama give speeches, ulama give sermons, ulama give lectures on Ghadir to keep alive the legacy of Eid al Ghadir. But I tell you, if you study the lives of the ulama, of the scholars, they have done far more than just give lectures. They have done far more than just come and give a small speech. Allama Abdul Hussein Al Amini traveled countries. He died only in 1970, if I remember correctly. He passed away. Abdul Hussein Amini, known for his famous book, Al Ghadir, Fil Kitabi Wal Sunnah Wal Adab. An encyclopedia of Ghadir he collected. He says, before this encyclopedia took 40 years to compile. He says, I read 10,000 books back to front before I started writing. I refer to 100,000 books. His library today remains the biggest library, library of Amir al Mu'mineen in Najaf al Ashraf. Alama al Amini took on this responsibility for himself that he will collect all the evidence from Sunnah and Shia, from both, from Fariqain, to prove to the world that there remains no doubt in the Hadith of Ghadir. He has collected 20 volumes, 11 are published in the Arabic. He concludes that Hadith of Ghadir, this incident of Ghadir has reached such a level that there can never be any doubt. It has such, it has been narrated from 110 companions. Hadith has been divided into four parts. Sahih al-Sanad, Muwathaq, Hassan, and Da'if. Sahih al-Sanad is the Hadith where all of the narrators in the chain of narration are Shia, Ithna Ashari, 12 or Shia. It is a Hadith which is trusted it has the highest authority. Then you have Hassan, where they are all Shia, but perhaps they are not all praised. The Rawat, the Ravi of the Hadith. Then you have Muwathak, where you have non-Shia narrators. Some of them are praised, but there is no 
criticism against them. And then you have the hadith which is da'if, which does not match any of the criteria above. However, Allama al-Amini says, hadith of Ghadir has reached the level of mutawatir. Mutawatir is a hadith which occupies a station higher than sahih hadith. It is a station that comes very high when it comes to the study of hadith, ilm al-rijal. When we study hadith in the Hawza, we are taught this module that any hadith which is sahih al-sanad is accepted, of course, with the, under the supervision of the ulama. But hadith of mutawatir is a hadith which leaves no doubt. It comes high to the level of Quran. It is a hadith which is qat'i al-sudur. There is no doubt that this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, after all my research, he traveled to Iran, he traveled to Iraq, he traveled to Lebanon, he traveled to Turkey, he traveled, Ayatollah Amini, he traveled to India, to Lucknow, to the city of Lucknow, to visit the libraries, to get his hands on the manuscripts. When he returned, they asked him, uh, Ya Sheikh, how was the weather in Lucknow, in India? And he says, I do not know. I stayed in the library, I slept in the library. In other words, he worked so hard to compile Ghadir. Very recently, only died in 70s. He put all this effort for a very good reason. And the reason is that this day forms a part of our belief. Our deen is naqis. Allah is saying, today I completed religion for you. In other words, he's saying religion was incomplete until yesterday. Today I completed Islam. Hence, it goes to show without wilaya, religion of Islam is incomplete. And the hadith in Al-Kafi says, nothing is emphasized in the religion. Nothing has been stressed uh, nothing has been given so much importance in the religion of Islam. Nothing has been called for so much in the religion. Like wilaya. Wilaya occupies a position unlike any other position. When there is, when you are traveling, you are a musafir. Your salat, your namaz is qasr. When you are traveling, fasting is not prescribed upon you until you return home when you are ill if you cannot stand to offer your prayer you can sit if you cannot sit you can lay down if you cannot lay, if you cannot even pray you can pray with ishara in other words with the different ibadah if you do not have the istita hajj is not wajib on you until you have the istita unless you have the capability it's a very important point i want to bring you to the reason I mentioned these. In other words, Allah is, Allah's religion is flexible. If you can't do it, no problem, you can do it like this. If you can't fast now, no problem, you can fast when you get back to your watan, your country. If you can't pray, no problem, you can sit and pray. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's religion is flexible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's religion has compensation. He will compensate you. If you can't do it now, you can do it later. But wilaya is a thing in which there is no flexibility. Allahu Akbar. The ulama say there is no flexibility in the acceptance of wilaya. You cannot say I am ill. Today I don't want to accept wilaya of Ahlul Bayt. Today I am traveling. Is the wilayat of Ahlul Bayt saqit? Is it taken? No. Wherever you are, musafir or hadir, traveler or a non-traveler, ill or healthy, man or woman, Wilayat of Ahlul Bayt does not have flexibility as such. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it incumbent. And so wilayat is in the heart. If your life is in danger, you don't have to proclaim it aloud. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah the Almighty gives us the tawfiq to understand the religion of Al Muhammad. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he protects the lives of the Shia, of the lovers of Imam Amir al Mu'mineen wherever they are around the globe. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he prolongs the lives of, our, lives of our parents and our grandparents and he forgives them if they, know, they are no longer with us. 
We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he prolongs the lives of our teachers, our ulama and maraja. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he returns Imam Sahib al Asr was the man back to us with the loudness of his salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Thank you very much. Um, do we have some time for questions, if there are any? That's a good sign. <laughs> Say briefly, if you just um, give us... Um, some explanation why imams emphasize the point about the Eid al-Ghadir and Dulaya. Just briefly, to uh, we need to settle down in the minds and hearts of our children, especially. Why imam? Emphasized repeating the, uh, the uh, you know, the uh, Wilaya and Eid al-Ghadir. Yes. <coughs> so, like I the talk, because there are certain things that form a part of our aqaid. Aqaid has to be discussed. There's a, re a tradition from Imam Sadiq sallallahu alayhi. A non-Shia came to Imam Sadiq and he asked, why do the Shia do so much for Ashura? Why do the Shia come together for Ashura? And we find there's so much commotion in the Shia world on the day of Ash Muharram. Imam sallallahu alayhi gave a very good reply. He said, had we not, sell, ha, sorry, not sorry, have, had we not gathered and commemorated and did aza for Ashura, for Muharram, you would have forgotten Ashura like you forgot Ghadir. We do this to keep it alive so that it keeps the memories alive generation after generation. Imam says, if we left Ashura, who else would come together for Ashura? You look around the world. Where, if the Shia were to sit home one year around the globe for Ashura, what would happen around the world? You would see, no one would know what happened to Imam Hussein. It is the Shia, when they come together, this raises, this is a way of raising awareness. People look, people see, people ask questions. What is going on? What happened today? What, what, what um, what does today symbolize? In the same way, Ghadir should reach a level that people should question what happened. What We just finished with Eid al-Fitr. We just finished with Eid al-Adha. What Eid is this? People question. And it's good when they question. Then it is an opportunity for tabligh. It is an opportunity for putting our point across that this is the Eid al-Akbar. This is the Eid, which is the king of all Eids. So Imam Salamullah Alayhi is perhaps giving an answer to you as well in this, that we want to keep the memory alive or the people would forget. Amir al-Mu'mineen, after Rasulullah, he, uh, he confronted certain companions and he said, have you forgotten Ghadir? I don't want to mention the names of the companions. He mentioned, he comes to them when Khilafah is taken from Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen. He says to one companion who is sitting in a gathering, he says, oh Fulan, oh so-and-so, have you forgotten what Rasulullah announced on the day of Ghadir? Do you know what he said? He said, I am old of age and my memory is now weak. I, cannot no, I can no longer remember what happened on the day of Ghadir. Do you know what Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen said? Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen gave a very wise reply. He said, if that is the case, if you are weak, uh, if you are old in age and your memory is weak, Allah have mercy on you. But if you are lying, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expose your lie to the people. It is said that this companion, or so-called companion, when he stood from there, from that play, uh, where he was sitting, as soon as Imam Amin Mu'minin said that, the, the Muarrikhin have written that it did not take even as much time for him to stand, that his face was covered with white... Um, Yes, this, the white flakes, this, there is a um, skin condition. His face was covered with white uh, flakes. The riwayah says that he hid his face with the niqab and he left the mahfil of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen. 
That was Imam Amir Mu'mineen. Ali ibn Abi Talib was, uh, in a way, if you like, celebrating Ghadir by reminding, asking people, do you not remember Ghadir? You are taking my haq. After the death of the second Khalifa, when there was a shura of six people, when the second Khalifa said, after me, they, these six people will come together and one of them will be a Khalifa and, if and whoever does not agree, you are to kill him. Amir Mu'mineen, in that, if you read the riwayah, Alam al-Hilli has in his kitab, Kashful Yaqeen fi Fadail Amir al-Mu'mineen, the whole riwayah, it's a lengthy tradition. In there he says, how can anyone be more qualified of Khilafah? Do you not remember Ghadir? So the reason for our remembrance of Ghadir is that we see this as part of our theology, our aqai, our asl, not our furu' al-deen. There is usul al-deen and there is furu' al-deen. Our asl, our roots of the religion, the rest are the branches. We do not see wilaya as branches. Wilaya is part of the usul. Hope that answers the question. Any further questions? Assalamu alaikum. Uh, you said that there were more than 100,000 people in Ghadir. So it was only after a very short time when the Holy Prophet departed. And why not those 100,000 people, why, why did they not come forward to say what they heard, what the Holy Prophet said on the day of Ghadir? And also, yeah. uh, I believe the second Khalifa was the first person to congratulate Imam Ali. So why was he not in favor of that when he heard, when he was the first himself to congratulate Imam Ali <coughs> So we have the same question to our mukhalifin actually, that if in your uh, books as well, we have the riwayah, and you're absolutely right, second Khalifa was the first one to congratulate Imam Amir Mu'min, Bakhin, Bakhin, Laka, Yabn, Abi Talib. Uh, congratulations to you, O oh, the son of Abu Talib, Asbahta Mawla, you have become my Mawla and the Mawla of Kulla Mu'minin Ba'da Rasulillah. So we ask the same question to them. This is a sh this th here there is a problem. Here there is a shortcoming. And it shows that there is some research to be done. Something doesn't add up. It's not right for someone to come give bay In fact, he gave bay'ah. He gave allegiance. And bay'ah is mubaya'ah. It is between two people. I give you my bay'ah. The, when the person gives allegiance to the imam, he accepts the fact, I will support you. I will not plot or plan against you. I will not join your enemies, etc., etc. In return, you offer me leadership. So the second khalifa was the first to congratulate and he comes and gives bay'ah. But after Rasulullah, his attitude changes. In fact, on the deathbed of Rasulullah, his attitude changes. So he knows be best why he did that. But the other question is, uh, sorry, the other question, majority of the people, there were 100,000, some have written 90,000, some have written more than 100, 124,000, some, uh, some of the historians. But whatever the number, it was a very large number. And you see, majority of the people either fear the government, they fear prosecution, they fear jail, they fear being targeted, they fear being driven out of their lands, out of their homes. And uh, even today, majority of the people, they don't want problems. It's only some people who will come out, really who have a fire in their hearts, who really want to, that's why we say, where were the Sahaba? Imam Hussein, only 72 in Karbala. Where were Ahl al Madina? Where was Ahl al Makkah? Where were they? So you really need that fire of wilaya to come and support. And in fact, the leaders, Sa'ad ibn Ubada, who was the chief, the leader of one of the tribes of Aus, Aus and Khazraj were two tribes. Sa'ad ibn Ubada, who was the leader of Aus, if I remember correctly, he refused to give bayah. He says, have you forgotten Ghadir to the first Khalifa in Saqifah? Have you forgotten what the messenger of Allah had said? So the elite, in fact, the Salman al-Farisi, one of the elite, Abu Dhar al-Ghaffari, the elite, Hudayfa al-Yamani, Miqdad. So the uh, 
kabir min al-sahab. The great from amongst the companions refused to give bay'ah. So there was commotion. But the, I guess there was pressure from the government. Uh, they had taken uh, uh, charge. Sorry? They were, they were threatened. Not only were they not threatened, you could not narrate any hadith in regards to Ghadir, in regards to Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen. There was a ban on narrating hadith. In fact, you know, uh, uh, the book introduction to hadith has a whole, is translated in English, there is a whole chapter on this. No one was allowed to narrate the hadith of Ghadir. They would burn the Ghadir, uh, they would burn the hadith in the first, the time of the first and the second Khalifa. In fact, uh, it is said that the first and second Khalifa would ask companions, do you have collection of hadith in your homes? And anyone who would say, yes, we have collection from Rasulullah, they would take and burn. Sunni and Shia ulama, Sheikh Abdul Hadi al-Fazli in his kitab, Usul al-Hadith has narrated this. You were not allowed to narrate any fadila, any merits of Imam Amir al mumin In fact, any hadith was banned. This is the whole Hasbuna Kitab Allah, right? The book of Allah is enough. Why? Because there are hadiths in favor of Ahlul Bayt. But perhaps they, they did not understand Kitab Allah. Kitab Allah says, إِنَّمَا وَلِيُكُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Kitab Allah is saying your walid, Allah is Rasul and Ahlul Bayt. Inshallah, Allah is with us. Any final questions? Thanks for your talk. Thank you. Um, we've been discussing your topic area and we feel like with the other Eids, especially Eid al-Fitr, there's this anticipation for the Eid and um, people look forward to it. Even non-Muslims are aware of the Eid. It's easy to get a day off work or easier. In some organizations, you'd be offered it because they'd know that you've been fasting for so long in the run-up to Eid. Whereas with this Eid, I feel it's more like a silent Eid and um, not as well known. So. I guess the first question that we'd put forward is what can we do more, especially for the children of the community, to propagate the Eid so that um, it's celebrated on a huger level and um, there's more sort of recognition and um, celebration for it. And secondly, we'd say that how can we still do that without compromising the Muslim Brotherhood and unity with our brothers, especially our brothers in the Sunni faith? Thank you. Excellent. MashaAllah. Ahsan. Very good question. This question is always asked, how can we <coughs> celebrate our aqaid, our beliefs, our theology? Uh, your first question, before I come to the second one. <coughs> it's important um, to, I understand obviously it's difficult to get days off with jobs and schools and universities and people are busy. So, I mean, that's not something in your hands, it's not something in our hands. Whatever we can do, we should try to do. If it is not the same day, perhaps the next day, or the weekend, perhaps. But the important thing is that it should stay alive. Not that I don't have a day off today, Ide Ghadir is gone, forget about it. Even if it is the next day, or the two days after, or on the weekend, whenever the opportunity comes, it preferably it should be on the day. If it has to be at night time, it has to be at night time, you know, one or two hours at night. It's, it's all right. And <coughs> what can the kids do for kids is very important because perhaps for kids, this is not uh, very engaging, the lecture. So it's better for them to understand the reality of Ghadir in the Madaris. So we have schools, we have Sunday school. Uh, most of the centers, Imam Bargas around UK have Sunday school. So this should be discussed in uh, their curriculum, it should be discussed on a in a class-to-class -class basis uh, and it should be taught to them. Perhaps that would be more beneficial for the younger generation. Second question, <coughs> how can we discuss this without compromising unity? The same question is asked in Ayam Fatimiyya, the same question is asked in Muharram, how can we recite Ziyarat Ashura without compromising unity? Uh, one of the ulama of Qom, I think Ayatollah Jawadi 
Amuli or Ayatollah Muhammad Taqim Isbah Yazdi, one of the two authors. I can't remember which one, but he writes in his book. He says, unity does not mean that we compromise our aqidah, our aqaid. Unity does not mean that we forget our own belief system. Unity does not Unity does not come at the cost of me losing my religion, at the cost of me losing my own values. This is perhaps not understood in the community well, or perhaps it is not explained well by the, by the speakers, by the uh, people that come in the member. And my humble uh, try is to put forward this point tonight, is that unity, perhaps there's a misconception that for unity we must hide our be beliefs, uh, we must hide our aqaid, or we must not mention our most symbolic days. That is not the case. Everything can be done in its right environment with its right tariqah, its right method, methodology, and amongst the right people. There are certain courses that we can adopt for us to still discuss our aqaid and still have that unity. Because if, if for the sake of unity, I am losing my own belief, I don't know what is the asul of my deen. I don't know what is the principles of my faith. I don't know wilaya, I don't know imam, I don't know adl, I don't know tawheed. Then this type of unity is causing harm to the religion of Ahlul Bayt. I don't know it, my son won't know it. If my son doesn't know it, his son, his children won't know it. We can't have that. Then in the third, fourth generation, the mazhab of Ahlul Bayt is lost. We have met I've heard from my teachers, ulama, who have met people from the elderly generation, 80 plus, 90 even, who come and question them on simple facts. They said, we don't know what happened to Fatima to Zahra. We don't even know what, 90 years, 80 years. We don't know what happened to her. What is her tragedy? Will her killers be punished? Or will Allah forgive them? Because they were from the companions. And when, and when um, the ulama, the, our teachers, when they reply to them, no, they will be punished. It comes as a shock to the elderly, some of the elderly community in some part of the world. This is a real case scenario. This is not acceptable. Because slowly and slowly, if father doesn't know, if I as a father don't know, my child won't know. If my child doesn't know, then his child won't know. Slowly, slowly, generation after generation, this will vanish. It will disappear. So we must have our, we must openly discuss our aqaid with respect to the other school of thought, with respect to the other religion, with respect, because other people are sentimental about their own values and their religion, and so are we. So we respect their ideology, but we respectfully disagree, and we let them know that this is what happened. And this is what happened but we respect that you have your religion, we have own, our own, lakum deenukum waliyadeen, you have your own faith, we have our own faith. In this boundary of respect, we can keep our faith and still have unity. There are certain things perhaps we may not be able to get so close, our ikhtalafat, our differences will stay and they probably will stay until the day of judgment. But the point is that we come together on common platform. We come together on, on things that unite us. But brothers and sisters, I stress on this. And you know, this question is asked a lot. And we find that a lot of people perhaps uh, not understood this concept uh, very well. Unity does not mean a compromise to your belief. You are to live your, especially living in the West where there is no threat to your life. It does not compromise and it should not compromise our own belief. We should not become weak in our iman for us to save uh, someone else's feelings. I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much, Sheikh. I think we'll have to end there. Um, salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah. 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 Allah.